Hello and welcome back to another episode of Pizza and Property. But it's not just any episode. This is our very special 200th episode. Well, there's actually a few more than that on there, but it's our 200th proper long form episode, which is super exciting for us. I'm not even going to go into the whole backstory of everything because I've got way too much to share with you guys right now in this episode. And we're going to be talking about our guests and the awesomeness that they're going to bring on the property investment side of things in just a second. But before we do, I had two very quick announcements. Number one, we're in the new studio. Finally, this thing has taken way longer than I thought it was going to. But we're actually in here now, which I know on the surface probably doesn't really sound that exciting for you guys. But bear with me because it will be. We're going to be bringing you guys a ton of new videos, content, a podcast, magazine articles, everything that is entertaining and educational for an Aussie property investor that is wanting to build their portfolio. Been talking about it for a little while now. We now have the space, the facilities, the resources to create that. Well, like we've been creating it. Let me let me read the word that to, to absolutely 10x what we're creating. Give more and give better for you guys. And on that note, I've got a pretty amazing announcement that I'm super pumped about. If you guys remember, if you've been listening for the show for a, for a little while, on our 100th episode, we gave away a, a pizza every day for 100 days. We gave away like 100 pizzas. It's pretty cool, right? But this time, the celebration is going to be focused more on you and on property rather than the pizza. There's a little bit of pizza involved. Every month for the next six months, with at least the next six months, we're going to be giving away flights and accommodation to fly you right here to the Pizza and Property Studio in Adelaide so you can talk to the best accountants, buyers agents, property investors, mortgage brokers, sales agents, like whoever you need. We're going to put the team together to get you unstuck. We've done this episode before and we had such a positive response from it. And I personally, I loved the idea. Like they were fictitious characters before. It was just like it was a Jane and Jim situation. Now, I want this to actually potentially be for you. So click the link in the show notes below and tell us three things. Where you are now, what's your portfolio looking like? And it could be zero, it could be a hundred, it doesn't matter. I mean, if it's a hundred, I'm pretty sure you know how to get unstuck already, but you probably nailed that bit. But it's irrelevant. Just tell us where you are now. Tell us where you want to be. What does that end goal actually look like? And finally, tell us why you're stuck. Why do you think you can't move forward the way that you want to move forward in your property investing goals? Every month, one person's going to be picked, flown down to Adelaide to sit right here across the table with me. And just in case you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, I'm, I'm pointing to an empty seat in the studio right now. But for everyone else watching on YouTube, you can see exactly what I'm doing. But you'll be sitting here sharing your story, getting the absolute best in the country for your situation to get you unstuck. Because I know that if you're stuck on that, chances are there are thousands of other people that are maybe stuck on it as well. So not only is this going to be amazing for, for the people that actually fly over, it is going to be so beneficial for everyone listening because we want to help you block whatever is in your path. Block? No, the other way around. You know, smash, smash out whatever's blocking your path so you can start absolutely killing your property investing goals and growing the portfolio that you know you want to to start living life the way you want. I told you it's better than 100 pizzas, but more than likely, we're, we're going to go out for a pizza anyway, whoever ends up coming down here. But enter today, you've got absolutely nothing to lose. And if you win, you've got a whole lot to gain. Winners will be announced on the show, so stay tuned, and obviously, terms and conditions apply. I feel like I've been saying this for a while now, that I want to make this show more about you guys. And, and to me, this is just step number one in actually really doing that. Like This, this has been a, a crazy journey for me so far starting this thing in, in mum's back shed to now sitting here in our own purpose-built studio in the city. Yeah, this, this is nuts. And, and I need to, to thank every single one of you that listen to the show, and, and which is exactly why I'm doing this, because it's one thing to just say, oh, cheers, like, thanks. And it's another to actually go, let's, let's help more than anyone else. And let's do something that no one else is doing to help in a way that no one else is helping which is exactly what I think this is the first step in creating for you guys. But anyway, that was a little bit of something different because obviously it's the 200th episode. I've got to announce something fun and cool as well as the amazing guests that we've got on the show today. Channel 7, 9, and 10 call him the property professor. When they need commentary on what's happening in the market, he is the voice of property that they lean on. Well, they, I don't think they actually lean on him, but they, they go to him. Over 10 years ago, his book, Top Australian Suburbs, was published and with an astonishing accuracy rate, almost all all of his predictions were bang on. And a lot of the investors that actually followed and purchased in these suburbs did smashingly well, made millions of dollars in some cases. And today, I wanted to invite him back on the show. We're talking with Peter Kalisos, and we're talking about his new list and five top picks from that new list that we'll be sharing with you guys today. 
Well, I won't be sharing them. He, he, he's sharing them. It's, it's definitely not my list. He's, he's put this together himself. I'm not taking credit there. As well as that, we're going to let Peter do what he does best, which is teach. There's a reason that they call him the property professor. The guy is actually a lecturer. Like, he's at uni. He's the one behind the ball pit. Ball, ball pit? Pu- pupit? I don't know. But whatever. You know. He stands at the front and talks to everyone. But Peter and I are going to be talking about how interest rates really affect property prices. We're going to chat in a little bit more detail on how the changes that APRA made back in 2017 are actually what's driving the rental crisis today and how that affects you as a property investor, as well as supply, demand, and what you need to look out for as far as shifts are concerned as a property investor when you're growing your portfolio. But like I said, guys, this is a longer one than usual. Obviously, introductions don't normally go on for like the half an hour or whatever I've been talking for now. But just before we get into the episode, let's do a very quick sponsorship message. You want an accountant that has the in-depth knowledge of the tax system and portfolio creation that actually practices what they preach. The accountants at KHI Partners are a dedicated team of property investors that have helped over 16,000 of their clients successfully grow their portfolios whilst getting the best return to actually match their strategy. That's a key point as well. So if you're looking for an accountancy firm that has the knowledge and property expertise to help you with your property investing goals, talk to KHI today or click the link in the show notes below and find out more about KHI partners and how they can help. But right now, let's get into the episode to hear more about Peter's top picks for all of us property investors. Peter Kalisos, in the flesh. How are you, man? I'm very good, thank you, Todd. Firstly, I must apologise. I've just come from g- the gym. I didn't yeah. realise it's a vidcast as well as a podcast. But it, it, it's actually good for people to see that I have come from the university, but from the university gym. And did you actually run here? No, well, I parked no. the car over oh, here. Okay. <laughs> so I have actually uh, retired and just yep. gone back to teach. Uh, so I'm no longer the program director at, of the Master of Property. How does it feel? Oh, I'm fantastic. Like this, it's a it, today was a beautiful day in Adelaide. Yeah. So I went for a, an hour walk along uh, West Beach and Henley Beach. Yep. Stopped in for a coffee, had some lunch, went to the gym, do a podcast with you, and then who knows what will happen this afternoon. They they say that you can get a bit bored in retirement, but I'd say that you'd still be having a, a few projects on the side yeah. and well, just. Had, so yesterday I had a, a meeting uh, in Ardrossan. Yep. Based on property. Today I've got this. Tomorrow I am teaching. And Thursday, I'm doing a presentation for the Australian Property Institute Young Property Professionals on gentrification. Okay. So I can take on as much or as little as I like. So am I bored? Absolutely not. Am I loving it? Absolutely not. It sounds like it's come back to the choice rather than to just sit on the beach. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. That's awesome. Mm. All right. Well, as as far as today is concerned, you're you're the big two hundredth episode, oh, and I'm honoured, mate. Two hundred. That's a that's a big achievement. Uh, it, Congratulations. We thought it was a big achievement, like actually even getting you on the show. <laughs> when, when we Jack and I, I've never told you this, but but we like high fived, and it was this big cheer because it was like, oh, the guy from the telly, and he sells the books at the airport, and we were pumped when you very first came on, and that was like we're talking like episode seven, I think it was. Oh. It was very very early days. Equally as pumped to have you back on the show. And we want to talk about your view on where things are going, a little bit more of a breakdown on interest rates, property prices, and also talking hotspotting. That's always the name of the game. People always want to say, like, we're, or not say, see rather, where's going to be potentially the next spot to really pick. So is there anything you wanted to set the stages before, stage well, with rather? I think if people wanted to follow up after the podcast, a bit like you did in preparation for this, yep. if you go to YouTube, Google, Unlocking Property Insights. We'll, we'll actually have it linked in the show notes Excellent. below. And yep. that'll give them a much deeper explanation yep. as to what's happening and in particular why it's happening. Very good video. Highly recommend you click that and have a watch. All right, well, Peter, could we start with a, a bit of a general market overview and then drill down into a few more specifics? Sure. So the big news is the increase in interest rates. So we've had 400 basis points over the last year or so. They've been awesome. Yeah. yeah. And you would think <laughs> that that would put a huge dampener on the property market. But interestingly, yes, it certainly slowed down the rate of increase, mm-hmm. but we are still seeing property price increases around the country. Sydney would be at the at the top of the league table with an increase of almost 5% over the last uh, three months, yep. and Darwin is the only capital city that has not grown in value. We've also had some good growth from some of the regional areas, regional South Australia, almost 3%, regional Queensland, 2.5%, uh, so that's pretty good. But when we look at the whole year, mm-hmm. Adelaide and Perth have been quite resilient, 
as Perth has actually increased 2.5% over the last 12 months. Yeah, it's doing well. Uh, now, Adelaide hasn't gone up in value, mm -hmm. but the other way to look at it, it hasn't gone backwards in value, like many of the other capital cities over the last 12 months. Look, realistically, three months is not a long time in property. Yep. 12 months gives us a bigger, pic a better picture of what's happening. Hobart, unfortunately, is at the bottom of the league table where property prices today are almost 13% lower than they were this time last year. Hobart's been sprinting for a long time, though. It, it had to take a little rest at some point. Yeah, I mean, and it's surprising that uh, you know, a small place such as Hobart does so well, but I think it's a reflection of the increased interest from mainland investors mm -hmm. and also uh, overseas investors. A lot of overseas in, in Hobart. Yeah, I, I think... Um, I mean, technically everything's overseas investing for Hobart. <laughs> That's true. Very true. But what you've got is a, a big focus on green and clean in Tasmania. Yep. Um, and a lot of places are Airbnb. So there's a lot of holiday makers yeah, okay. in Tasmania. So that's restricted supply of long-term rental properties, mm -hmm. hence why rents have gone up significantly in, in Hobart uh, as well as Tasmania as a whole. But, yeah, it's been an interesting story in Hobart, Tasmania for the last, at even 15, almost 20 years ago. Like there was one year, I reckon it was 2003, property prices in Hobart increased about 50% in one year. That is insane. And that was, again, driven by mainland investors, in particular those from Victoria. Yeah, right. Mm. So it's history repeating itself. Okay. And I wanted to quickly jump in on Darwin because we never talk about Darwin. We even did an episode, uh, I don't know how many, you're going to have to rewind back if you want to listen to it. It was The title was, Is Darwin Dead? Mm -hmm. and, and it just kind of feels like maybe it is. Like what, what would you need to see to actually go, oh, Darwin, worth a look in now? Uh, look, for me, a place like Darwin is heavily dependent on resources. Yep. And as we've seen with Perth, and Western Australia as a whole, mm -hmm. even though Perth's doing you know pretty well the last 12 months. Like I was doing some research on how well or how poorly my forecast went uh, from the suburbs that I selected 15 years ago. How'd you go? And unfortunately, I did. If you take out Perth, I did exceptionally well. I would have got a high distinction. Okay. <laughs> but there are some places in Perth, yeah. in particular around Mandurah, where property prices are lower today than they were 15 years ago. And that is, I think, one of the main reasons is because there was a high dependency on people working in the mining sector. So I know a lot of places in Mandra have done incredibly well, even over just the past three and six months from data I've seen. But that's recovery, not boom, you're saying. That's, so if you go back, so if somebody held their property for 10 years yeah. in Mandra, they probably lost money. All right, they've made money in the last three or six months. Yeah. But... If you go back what the price was 10 years ago, uh, and places like Hall's Head, Falcon is another one that comes to mind, they've, they've just been hammered by the uh, downturn in the mining industry. Yeah, so okay. if you look at the ABS stats, mm -hmm. I think there's about 10 times as many people that work in the mining industry that live in the Mandurah area, not just the suburb, but the Mandurah area. Like the LGA. As, yeah, yeah, as compared to the Australian average. So if the mining sector is doing well, you can assume that Mandurah and its local area would... If the mining sector is not doing so well, uh, which it hadn't up until recently, like COVID, COVID changed a lot of things, mm -hmm. uh, in particular now that uh, a lot of governments are, are putting money into infrastructure, mm -hmm. you need steel for that and you need iron ore to make the steel. So Western Australia is doing really well at the moment, but our, in 2006, I reckon property prices increased by 55%. Mm -hmm. In one year, but basically ever since then, it's been going backwards. Would you buy there now? Too risky for you. Well, well let's just set the scene. Right? Yeah. I'm 62. Okay. All right. I've got enough properties, uh, and I see Perth and Western Australia as a riskier investment. doesn't mean that I wouldn't invest there, mm -hmm. but you could do really well or you could do really poorly. Risk is the variance in return. It's like, it's like investing in a mining town. You can do really, really well if mine's doing well, mm -hmm. or you could do really poorly. Personally, I would invest in Adelaide and South Australia because I know my backyard the best. Interestingly, over the last 20 years, do you know which capital city has performed the best after Hobart? Which capital city? I I'm going to guess Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> That's dead right. So Adelaide, uh, Adelaide is the quiet achiever. Mm. You know, Sydney and Melbourne are always in the news, especially because you've got a, one of your podcasts is focused on property news. Mm -hmm. It's generally heavily biased towards Sydney and Melbourne, what's happening there. Yep. But, you know, in the background, Adelaide is doing okay. And look, I'm apolitical. I'm neither Liberal nor Labor, but I think the government that we have in at the moment 
is very progressive and I can see some really good things happening with the South Australian economy, which okay. means it's going to flow on to the South Australian property market. And if you look at the opposite end, in Victoria, like they were hit really hard with COVID and they still haven't fully recovered. And now there are some uh, laws going in, especially so far as residential tenancies is concerned, mm-hmm. that is going to hit the property market. Some, uh, some land tax laws have changed, which is going to hit mm-hmm. property investors. So I would be wary about investing in Melbourne and Victoria, mainly because of the legislation. And to, ask, to answer your original question, I, I, I stick to my backyard yep. because location is so important in property and in particular, local knowledge. You know, like you and I live in the western suburbs, right? Yep. But, you know, you and, because you were in real estate before we started this podcast, mm-hmm. you would know which parts, for example, of my lend to invest in mm-hmm. and which not to. I know which parts of Torrensville to invest in and which parts. Yep. So it's that specific local knowledge. It's not just investing in a particular suburb. It's investing in a particular street in that suburb, which can make all the difference. I know you're a big, like you did a lot of uh, selling down in Christie's Beach, Port and Alunga. A lot, lot down south, yeah. Yeah. You know, Christie's Beach, certainly an area I would invest in. Christie Downs, which is just across the road, I wouldn't invest. If I'm looking for capital growth, because that's the sort of property investor that I am, Mm -hmm. I focus on capital growth rather than rental yield. Yeah, I'd be going for the beachside suburbs rather than those across Dyson Road. Well, considering the the amount of interest rate rises we've had, I think it's twelve now. If mm-hmm. if I'm if I'm thinking of this right, I, I was actually talking to it was actually Karen. I don't know if you know Karen Baldwin. Oh, I do. Karen was one of my past students. Hello, Karen. There you go. Listening. Karen and I were actually chatting just today, and she was saying I can't remember who it was that she was talking to. Said that once we have three consecutive rate pauses we're going to see a second wind in the market. And and I wanted to, to use that as a little bit of a segue to get, one, your thoughts on that, but two, if you could expand a little bit more on your thoughts on how interest rate rises or just interest rate movements in general actually really are tied to property prices and how they affect them. Well, interestingly, uh, the research that I did showed interest rates don't have as large an effect on property prices as you would think. So generally speaking, Often the RBA will increase interest rates to slow down the rate of increase. Okay. So they may have succeeded in slowing down the rate of increase, but they certainly didn't succeed in bringing down property prices. June 94 to December 94, so that was six months, interest rates went up two and three quarter percent, but property prices still went up. Do you mind just this little graph here? Would we yep. be able to chuck that on our Instagram, Peter? Yeah, of course. Yeah? yeah. All right. If, if Just so you guys can follow along, head on over to our Instagram, just go to pizza and property. Um, on Insta, so you can actually see this chart that Peter's reading through. But sorry, Peter, continue. That's right. So September 99 to September 2000, which was a full 12 months, interest rates went up 1.5%, but property prices also went up 7.5%. March 2002 to December 2003, Mm -hmm. one and three quarter years, that's a long period of time. And that was boom time then, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But interest rates went up 1% in that time, Okay. but property prices went up 36%. Yeah, right. So, I mean... Rather than read them all out, because people will be able to check it out on your Instagram page, yep. the only one where interest rates have had a significant effect on property prices is is the most recent time. But they've gone up 400 basis points. So March 2002 to, I haven't put an end date yet, because I'm not sure when interest rates are going to uh, stop increasing. This chart shows interest rates went up three and three quarter percent. They've actually gone up 4% or 400 basis points. They have dropped in value. There's a question mark there, because we don't know how much more they're going to drop in value. Okay. So really, the last 30 years, interest rates have not been successful in bringing down property prices. They have may, may have been successful in bringing down the rate of increase, mm-hmm. but not bringing down property prices. I've said for many, many years in my class, the two most important factors in determining property price increases are consumer confidence yep. and the availability of credit, like how easy it is to get money from the bank. Even though... I've finished. Well, technically, I've finished teaching. I'm just part time now. Mm-hmm. I there is only one factor in my opinion, and that's the availability of. Credit. And the reason I've changed is during COVID, consumer confidence was quite low, but property prices still went up high. And one of the reasons is because interest rates were so low. So what a decrease in interest rates means it's easier to borrow money, and mm-hmm. you can borrow more money. Mm-hmm. So if you borrow, if you've got the opportunity to borrow more money, you will. It's not that you're going to say, oh, look, oh, no, I'll stick to the 500000 that you said that I could borrow six months ago, mm-hmm. and I'll just buy houses in that particular price range. 
If the bank says, no, well, because interest rates came down, you can now borrow 600000 well, to borrow 600000 Yep. And so, and, and I think a good illustration is what happened back in 2001, two and three when we had a big property boom. Mm-hmm. Do you remember no doc loans and low doc loans? I never used one, but yes, I know what you're talking about. So basically you signed a piece of paper and said, yes, I can afford this mortgage. And back then yields were quite high. Mm-hmm. So the rents covered all your expenses. So you could, I know people that bought tens of investment properties because the rents were paying off the mortgages. So it didn't really impact on their day-to-day living. And, you know, and 20 years later, obviously, they would be very, very wealthy. Why did they stop that? Because it does almost like the first thing that comes to mind is it sounds dodgy. It's just like, yeah, I owe you, here you go. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure there's a, a bit more rigmarole to it. But by the sounds of it, not a lot more. If, if we've got such a supply shortage now, should that not have been stopped? What would have happened if they didn't stop it is Australia would have started off the global financial crisis. So the mortgage crisis in right. the US yeah. was based on very loose lending. Okay. And that mortgage crisis in the US filtered into a global financial crisis. Right. And so... So we would have had the ninja loans. Right. Yep. Absolutely. I think, look, some banks might offer not no-doc loans, but low-doc loans, but it would be at a higher interest rate. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're almost a thing of the past. Mm. Sort of summarising what you're saying here is when interest rates are going up, typically property prices are going up with them. Mm-hmm. The exception to the rule now is now, right, right now, 2023. We don't know how much longer or where rates are going to go if they are just going to stop now. That's the big question mark. In future, when people are looking at this as like, oh, interest rates have gone up, it's time to stop. What I'm kind of hearing is, no, that's, it's not necessarily time to stop because usually if they're going up, it's because things are going really good and they need to try and slow it down. That's exactly right. The RBA is being reactive and trying to slow down the property market. That's what they are doing. Gotcha. Okay. Well, speaking of trying to slow down the property market, actually, before I get to the next question, is there anything else you wanted to add on to that, Peter? This situation that we have in property, and I know you've Mm -hmm. got a lot of property investors that are listening, this shortage of rental supply really started six years ago when APRA said to bank, basically they said to banks, if you lend to investors, Mm -hmm. they need twice as much deposit as Mm owner-occupiers. So at the moment, owner-occupiers can get a loan with 5%. Actually, some ca- it can get a loan with a deposit of 5%. Yep. In some cases, it can be lower. Like you can go to Home Start Finance and get one for 3%. But if you're an investor, you need a minimum of 10%. Yep. If you're an investor, you also pay a higher interest rate than an owner-occupier. Now, I've been investing in property for well over 30 years. And even when I started, there was no difference made between owner-occupiers or investors. That's only happened in the last few years. So what you've seen, and if people watch that that video on YouTube, which I did at uni, Mm -hmm. since 2017, really vacancy rates have decreased and the amount of investor loans have also decreased because there are less investors buying rental property, Mm -hmm. therefore vacancy rate drops. So this situation has been in the making for six years and it's going to take a while for it to correct. Just to play devil's advocate on that, has that got anything to do with home ownership increasing? Because I'm just picturing you and I were talking about The Guardian and different things like that before. That That's the headline that I picture jumping into the conversation. It, is that just a, a throwaway line or is there some legitimacy to that? Oh, look, the home ownership has increased. So if you look at the 2021 census data, home yep. ownership increased compared to 2016. Okay. But that's mainly because of the home builder, which encouraged people to buy a home. One of my students did a wonderful paper on home ownership. Mm-hmm. Is, it, is it disappearing or declining? And in Adelaide, it's, for the last 30 years, it's basically stayed the same. It's, a, it's around 70%. Sometimes it's 71 72%. Sometimes it's 68 69%. Minor changes. Yeah. But, and in most capital cities, it's pretty steady. In Sydney, though, there is an affordability issue and the rate of home ownership has been steadily declining over the last 20 to 30 years. But also, Todd, the culture has changed. Like when Mm -hmm. I was growing up, it was finish school, maybe get a trade or go to uni, Mm -hmm. get a job, get married, get a house. And that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. Now it's finish school, more likely to go to uni than get a trade. Mm -hmm. Probably stay at uni and do do your masters as well because life is pretty good. Yep. All right. And then maybe you hook up with someone, maybe you don't. And what's more important to you is where you live rather than owning the property that you live. So a lot of the young ones, if we use an Adelaide example, mm-hmm. would prefer to rent in Glenelg 
or Brighton near the beach rather than own a house in Seaford, in, in Seaford yep. or Plimpton, away from the beach. Yep. Gotcha. It's, it's definitely cha- – I, I remember you and I having a coffee and talking about that ages ago when I said, was it three times the median wage used to buy you the median house in 1950? And then it changed – and I'm using, like, average stats for the whole country. And this, this is actually stats from, I think, 2012, so they're very out of date. But then it changed to something like seven. I think it's now around 10 or 11. Don't quote me on this. But And I remember you actually bringing up a very interesting point that I'd never heard anyone else say, which is – you're not comparing apples and apples because the median house back then was like a 90 square meter, three bed, one bath, one living room. And we're talking rooms that were usually like 2.5 by three. They weren't huge. Now the median house has a cinema room, four bedrooms, two bathrooms, two car parks. Like it's 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 changing. And, and all the bells and whistles. So back in the old days, you would buy the house and then save up for curtains. Yeah. Often there would be newspaper in the windows. And then yeah. you would save up for air conditioning. My God, air conditioning was a luxury. But now... It's a standard. Yeah. Now everything is, is included. And the other thing is the medium wage has changed. So in the 50s, the medium wage was typically a blue-collar wage. Mm-hmm. Today, the medium wage is a white-collar wage. In the 50s, one blue-collar wage uh, was enough to service the mortgage on a home. Now you need one and a bit white-collar wages to service the the mortgage yeah. so it, it's still achievable mm-hmm. but what you need is more people in the house bringing in more money to pay off the mortgage i don't know about that some blue collar jobs you paid any tradies oh. recently jeez <laughs> firstly try and find a tradie <laughs> yeah. and then you know it's not less than three uh, three figures to come now, yeah it'll be a hundred bucks just to turn up and then it's a hundred bucks every 30 minutes after that our Thank dishwasher broke the other day we're just going to get a new dishwasher <laughs> it'll be cheaper <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> That's right. Uh, so as, as far as the, the APRA changes then, so we're talking 2017. I remember around then I had uh, issues with opens as well. Like it was like the market just went, no, yeah. we're, not, we're not doing anything now. And um, so you're saying that a lot of those changes uh, are the reason that we're seeing this lack of supply now, the rental crisis now, and basically it's, it's the knock-on effect. Yep. Yeah. So okay. it, it's, it's taken six years. And if you look at the ABS stats, you'll see that the number of rental properties available for certain, is it hasn't increased as it as it has in the last fifteen years, mm-hmm. and I'm just thinking that maybe it's actually lower in 2021 than it was in 2016. I'm not 100 percent sure of that, but I am 100 percent sure that it it's not where it should be if you look at that trajectory. Yep. And one of the reasons is investors were disincentivized to get into the market because you needed a bigger deposit mm-hmm. and you pay, had to pay a higher interest rate. Makes sense. Well. As, as far as the supply and demand side of things, and this is something that you talked about on, on your Adelaide Uni lecture, and, and I thought this was really good, talking about how supply and demand, actually, no, sorry, a demand, rather, can be turned on and off pretty quickly. Supply doesn't work the same way. Can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, what, what kind of a time frame are we actually looking at then, potentially, for the supply side of things to actually catch up with demand and meet that equilibrium? Yep. So... If we go back to 2020, June 2020, mm-hmm. the government announced the Home Builder Grant. Yep. So the next day, uh, home builder, uh, people could get a $15,000 grant towards their new home. All right? mm-hmm. So instantly, demand for new housing increased. We were in lockdown. So it was, I mean, thankfully, you know, those sorts of construction workers work outdoors, so they didn't have the same restrictions as indoor workers. Mm-hmm. So there were still some homes being built. But generally speaking, like a home before COVID may have taken seven or eight months. And then because of, during COVID, because of the supply chain issues and labour shortage issues, it, it was more than doubled. And so what you had was, again, demand was instantly increased, as it has in the past when they've announced first home owner incentives. Mm-hmm. But not only does supply take a while to come on board because that assumes that you've already got the land subdivided and the servant. Yep. But the other complication was you couldn't get all the material. Factories around the world had shut. Mm. Like, you know, the price of structural steel went through the roof, for example. Uh-huh. Like when I was teaching back in, even back in 2018, 2019, to build a typical two-storey townhouse was $1,300 a square metre. Today, it's $2,000 a square so that's a 50% increase mm. in only four or five years, mainly due to the shortage of materials and the shortage of, um, of labour. So now that Home Builder is gone, right, well, we're talking nationally here because there is another 
wonderful incentive in South Australia where first home buyers don't have to pay stamp duty mm -hmm. on new homes. I feel like that hasn't been talked about much. No, it hasn't. And I reckon that's one of the, the best incentives you can give because I'm a, I'm a big fan of getting first home buyers into their first home. You've got your foot on the first rung of the property ladder, mm -hmm. which is the hardest bit, and then providing you buy well, you can slowly move up the property ladder. But it's mm. getting your foot on the property ladder, yep. and the, the hardest, uh, it seems, for young people is is the saving of the deposit. So, mm. you know, $600,000 $600, house, let's say, generally you would need a $5,000 deposit, 30000 plus another 5000 for the stamp duty and the other fees. You mean 5%? 5%, sorry. Yeah, 5%. Gotcha. Yep. So we've got 30000 for deposit, plus another thirty for stamp duty. Yep. Take away the thirty for stamp duty, now you've only got to save thirty. Well, like, average, well, if a first-home buyer's salary is probably around 55000 you know, if you save hard enough over two to three years, that's one person. That's $350 a week over mm -hmm. two years. That's not that crazy. For, no. And for one, yeah. for, for two people, that's very achievable. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I look, I think that, and there are other governments that have done the same thing. New South Wales often brings that in and out. That is the no yep. stamp duty. Yep. And so, but if we look nationally, there's there's really no big incentive for first-home buyers. There, there are a few around, but nothing as big as home builder. Mm -hmm. And the supply will catch up because shortage of materials is not an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. Shortage of labour still is. Mm -hmm. So even though we went from taking 18 months to build a home instead of eight, that might come back to 12. And then once immigration sorts itself out and we have enough tradies, then we will probably get back to building a house from start to finish eight months. But we've got at least one to two years for for this to catch up. But I'm Todd, I'm only talking about the supply of new housing. One thing that's really come to the fore during COVID is I think the main reason property prices have still increased mm -hmm. is because the supply of any property to buy, because I'm still interested in that area down between Christie's Beach and Seaford, mm -hmm. and based on the price point that I'm looking at, which is something under 800000 there are only four houses open for inspection. On Now, that is unheard of. Yeah. So you still have some people interested in buying property because even though pr interest rates have gone up 400 basis points, mm -hmm. obviously some people can still afford to buy property. Yeah. So there's still plenty of people at open inspections, mm -hmm. but there are just less open inspections. And so the price of something is dependent on the demand and supply of it. If demand stays the same and supply drops price will go up. So instead of, say, people having a choice of six homes to look at over the weekend mm -hmm. and they can put in an offer and if they don't accept it, they probably won't go up. It doesn't matter. We'll find another six next weekend. Well, now you've only got two to, to put an offer in. If you don't increase your offer, you will probably miss out and there may not be any to inspect next weekend or the weekend after. Pressure's on. Yeah. So one, the other thing that I've seen, method of sale has changed. Often it's not a price... Best offer buy. There you go. Yeah. Which I think is better than auction because yeah. auction, you're only going to get the offer better than the second person. 100% agree with you. But, you know, best offer buy, well, you, you know, who knows? Depending on how much the person wants it, they could be $50,000 above the previous offer. I, I ran campaigns like that before where they were literally a quarter of a million dollars above the previous offer. It, sometimes it was absolute like night and day. And that was the way that I would explain that to vendors as well. So I think, yeah, yeah you bang on. So it, it's certainly, COVID has ch certainly changed many things and it certainly opened up my eyes. Like I, I'm a property economist, not a macroeconomist, but mm. to see how the economy and the manipulation of the economy, and by that I mean getting paid to stay home, like how does that work? You're, st you know, you're still getting paid. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, what's happened to the property market? Like I've never known, we've never known the whole world to shut down. Mm. You know, there have been times where there have been, where it's been hard to get a plumber or a carpenter or you, we couldn't get the tiles from Italy. But during COVID, you couldn't get anything. Would it be fair, not in the, the sense of what we went through, but in the comparison economically to compare it to a war? Yeah, yeah. But in, uh, different to a war, governments all around the world magically created all this money where they could pay people whilst they were at home, yep. but also spend money on infrastructure to encourage employment and to encourage economic activity. Um, Feels like we're just paying the bill for that now. <laughs> Well, Luckily, they were at low interest rates. So whatever money they borrowed, <laughs> they borrowed at really low interest rates. 
Uh, well, before we move on to your, your top picks moving forward, is there anything else that you wanted to, to wrap up there on the supply demand and really when supply is going to start catching up? Yeah, look, it, it, for me, it's not just about the supply of new property. Yep. It's when people feel confident enough to put their property on the market to sell. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons they're not doing it is because they're not sure if they can borrow enough money to move to a bigger and better home. But once interest rates at least stop increasing, mm-hmm. right? once they stop increasing and people are more certain of how much they can borrow, then I think you will see more properties come on the market, increase supply. So it's not just the new properties, because basically new properties only add 2% to the existing stock. So in simple numbers, you know, if, we, if there was a country town with 100 houses, next mm-hmm. year you would expect to see 102 houses. What we need to see is confidence come back into the market where people put their property on the market mm-hmm. so they can move up the property ladder and then somebody else can come in and... Okay, all right, so increasing supply. Um, mm. So as, as far as your top picks are concerned, now, this, this isn't just any old top picks list as well. I feel like just in case, if you haven't heard of Peter Kalisos before, like this man has literally written the book on, on hot spotting. What, what was the, the title of the book again, Peter? The Property Professor's Top of Australian Suburbs. And where can people get it? Just to give you a quick plug. And Peter hasn't asked me to do this. He probably no, doesn't even feel comfortable man. me doing it. Oh, look, I don't, online somewhere. I, Amazon, okay. Google. Let's say Amazon. Okay. Um, now, what was it again? It was Perth that was the only one that made yeah, it. So let's let's not talk about Perth. Okay. <laughs> but otherwise <laughs> but otherwise what I was getting at is pretty much nailed it. And yeah, but I I, I learned a big lesson from Perth. Because yeah. I've for me, I've been teaching a class for the last twenty five years. Mm-hmm. You know, I've I've always said if you're looking for capital growth and property, you want to be cl- close to the city or close to the sea. Yep. All right. And close to the city is more important. Okay. And Perth was an excellent example. In Perth, the suburbs that did perform well, and when I say well, they performed above the Perth average, yep. were places like Victoria Park, East Victoria Park, Morley. Uh, these are all close to the city. But the places that did poorly were down around that Mandurah area. And so I've changed, I've changed what I say in class now. You need to be close to the city or really close to the sea. And not just a suburb in the on the seaside, mm-hmm. but in a street close to. The, if you can afford to get onto the Esplanade, that's the best place because there's only one Esplanade. There's plenty of streets behind the Esplanade, but there's only one Esplanade. So it's back to, to scarcity. Really. It is. Yeah. It is. Okay. All right. What's uh, the first pick on the list? Okay. So, I, so it, if people buy the book, and and again, thanks for the plug, but I didn't come on here. For no, the I, plug. Know. I know. I, that, I that's why it. I did it. Yeah. yeah. I wrote it 15 years ago. Yep. But interestingly, most of those suburbs are still relevant because mm. suburbs take decades to come good or gentrify. Mm-hmm. So a lot of those suburbs that I've picked were going through gentrification. Places like Footscray and West Footscray in Melbourne, Erskineville and Marrickville in Sydney, um, Torrensville and Thebiton in Adelaide. And so these places take 20 to 30 years to gentrify. So even though their names appear in the book, which was written 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. most of those suburbs I would still be investing in because the one thing you can't change about them is their location. Mm. They are all either close to the city or close to the or beachside suburbs. Yep. So we are only looking at South Australian suburbs. No, no countrywide. What's uh, top five? Actually, it'd probably be good if we had a few outside of SA as well. All right. Now you put me on the spot. That's okay. We'll start with number one. Okay. Number one. Number one is Thebiton, or as or as our interstate investors call it, the, the Barton. Barton. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Look, better than Paraka. What, what do they call that? Hooraka. <laughs> Have you not seen how it's spelled? <laughs> Very good. Uh, so p- people should get on to Google and check out where Thebiton is. Like Theb- There's Thebiton, the parklands, and then the city. Yep. You can't live any closer to the city than Thebiton. And Thebiton was one of those areas, well, still is, high, high amount of industrial, mm-hmm. but that's changing. Like Coca-Cola was there. They've gone. Mm. The West End Brewery was there. That's all gone. They've gone. Yep. Uh, uh, the uh, printer, Will, I think it's Will's. They've gone. So these are all facing Port Road. They're all going to be major mixed-use development. And when you look further back away from Port Road, and you'll see a lot of those uh, light industrial places Mm -hmm. are leaving and being replaced by residential. And so, and because of its proximity to the city, very popular with international students. And so I would be, but to buy in Thebiton, 
you're going to need a fair bit of money. What's the median there? So there the median is about 900000 So I'm sorry, investors that are listening, but I focus on houses. Yep. And ideally suburbs which have a high proportion of character houses. And so what you'll find is my median is quite high. Okay. But like I've done with two of my children, you know, 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. If you can't afford 900000 maybe, you know, you and your mum or dad could go 50-50 or you and your brother or sister could go, or you and a mate. That does increase the risk, mm-hmm. which you need to be careful of. But I think buying a house in an inner city suburb, in particular a character or period style home, mm-hmm. is where the money is. So just for anyone listening, let's say in six months' time, and I'm assuming whenever the West End development's going to kick off, we're going to see some 5, 10, 20-storey towers out there, and they're thinking, oh, Thebiton, or Th- the Barton. <laughs> oh, I'll buy it here. Peter said it's good. So... Struck it off completely, like the units, apartments out there? I oh, know, never. No? no? you. If there's only one thing that people remember from this podcast, yep. is you are never, ever going to buy a brand new apartment. Okay. Never. It's like buying a brand new car and thinking it's going to be worth more next year for you to make money. It's just not going to happen. It just depreciates in value. That is a perfect way to put it. I like that. But just before we move on as well, with, with Thebiton, almost called it the button then, um, Devon Park. I was always confused by Devon Park because you go there, similar proximity. It's right next to like Ovingham. It's to me, it's like, why isn't this nice? You've been through Devon Park. I have, and that's why I'm asked the question. Like, why? Why isn't it not? I don't understand it. It's just right next to North Adelaide. Like, you could almost throw a rock at the most expensive home in Medindi from Devon. Like, it but you have to cross the train line to get to get to it. True. Yeah. Okay. It, it's just I look, I don't know what it is because I grew up in a real estate family because my father was a rich. That's right. And I, I can't explain it, but I drive through Devon Park. It, look, with, sorry all those people that might live in Devon Park. It might gentrify, but probably not in my lifetime. A lot of things will have to change. Okay. And, and in particular, that in, a lot of those industries will need to move out. And they'll probably need to be incentivized to move out. So maybe state government says, if you move from here and go to Edinburgh, yep. you know, you can go there and you won't need to pay, I don't know, well, there's some actually kind no of taxes t- yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And then this is exactly what I want to ask. Because to me, like just looking at both of them, like at face value, I can see that a lot of similarities, obviously not exactly the same, but it's still not enough of what concentration of character homes. Yeah, it, does, it has a lot of post-war homes, Yep. but not pre-World War II. Like, like you go through Thebiton, yep. Bowden, Brompton, right? And yep. then you go through Devon Park, it's like chalk and cheese. They might be the same distance from town, yep. but the housing is quite different. Interesting. Okay, cool. I appreciate that. Um, and what's, what's number two on the list? Right, so number two, I'm going to go to one of your favourite parts of the world and one of my favourite parts of the world, and that would be Port Nalunga South. Okay, and, and why is Porties on the list? So, in, you know, people say, oh, you know, amenities and close to transport is really important. In Adelaide, that doesn't mean much, and it's certainly important in Alunga South. Like, there is not one school in Port Nalunga South. There's Port Nalunga. Yeah, there isn't, is there? And there is Seaford. Yeah, okay. All right? There is, I reckon there is not one supermarket in Port Nalunga South. There's one on Seaford Road, which is technically on the Seaford side. Yep. But I don't reckon there's one supermarket. And there is one bus along the Esplanade and some other streets it goes through. But Port Nalunga South and Port Nalunga mm-hmm. still have that lovely holiday village feel about them nice wide streets houses set back from the the road still some shacks there Mm -hmm. um it's just got a wonderful feel about it people go surfing there you can't go swimming there because technically in front of port and along the south it's cliffs and it's rocks but a lot of people will go stand up paddle boarding Mm -hmm. and surfing generally the surfing happens next door at seaford or further up at uh, Christie's Beach. And just for anyone listening in either like Brisbane, Melbourne or Sydney, when Peter is saying next door, he's not meaning kilometres and kilometres <laughs> down the road. It is still like a walking distance That's next right. door. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so we're back to proximity to, to the water, but yeah. it's also the feel of the place. That's it, the big thing. And the yeah. other indicator is um, for the first time in my life, I yeah. paid six bucks for a coffee. Yeah. To me, that tells you something about the demographic living there. Like in the past, you may not have been able to charge six bucks mm-hmm. because the the permanents that were living there couldn't afford it. One yep. of the reasons they lived at Port Nalunga South because it was so far from town, it was pretty cheap. Yeah. But now it's not. Well, 
it's it's still a good area to get into, but it's a lot more expensive than it used to be. And so now people are happy to pay six bucks for their, I don't know, decaf, skim, whatever. For me, if your coffee takes more than three words, don't I'm not ordering <laughs> it for you, mate. All right? Even well, decaf flat white, that's four words. It doesn't work. <laughs> so for you, it's coffee. <laughs> Black, good. Latte, good. Where, where do you draw the line, though? Because if, if Port Nalunga South has been on the list for, for over a decade yeah. now, so why not, like, if, it, if the gentrification wheel has turned, if you will, why not Burnside? Why not, like, places that are? Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So th- there's not much gentrification happening in Port Nalunga South because there's not many character properties. Yep. That's, that's just a, a change in demographic. Okay. Uh, so and more like also, a urban renewal? Yeah. And, so, and also, the surfers that live in Burnside uh-huh. are buying holiday homes in Port Nalunga South. Okay. So Burnside, eastern suburbs. Yep. All right? So you can imagine if you live in Melbourne or in Sydney. So well, no, actually, or... the, in Sydney, the eastern suburbs on the coast, so it doesn't work that way. It, it, Turak or a Potts Point kind of equivalent. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you live on the other side of the city, mm. but you're buying yourself a holiday spot by a surf beat, and rather than go to Victor Harbour, which is more than an hour away, especially on the freeway, it's probably only 30, well, maybe 40 minutes from Burnside. It's a lot closer. Okay, so you still reckon there's plenty of uh, huff and puff left in Port Nalunga South? I hope so, mate, because I've got a number of my investment properties in Port Nalunga and Port Nalunga South. Well, look, I, again, I'm a man where, who puts his money where his mouth is. Yep. And and you'll see on that video how well my the, the 20 suburbs in Adelaide that I selected did, mm-hmm. and all bar one performed above the Adelaide average. And Port Nalunga South is one of the top performers. But I still think that will continue to perform well. Number one, where it's location, by the sea. Yep. And it's still got plenty of potential. Like, it'll never be a Glenelg, mm-hmm. right? Because Glenelg, you've got direct access to the city from Glenelg. Yeah. Right? It's never going to be a Glenelg, but it's still got a long way to go. Okay. And meat and house price for porties? Uh, 650. 650. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's number three on the list? Number three on the list, as people will see on the, the video, is a suburb called West Lake Shore. So a lot of people would know West Lakes. That's where Footy Park was and, uh, and where we played a lot of our AFL and SNFL. Now they've demolished Footy Park and all the footies played at Adelaide Oval. That's right. But what you've got is West Lakes, expensive suburb, median over a million. Mm-hmm. Tennyson, median over a million. But in West Lake Shore the median is well below a million dollars and you get similar houses and you are pretty close to the sea, the other body of water, which is West Lakes. And if again, if people look at that video, you'll see the house that was bought there. It was 750000 for a four-bedroom, two-bathroom home on 750 square metres. When was that? Uh, that was bought earlier this year. That's nuts. So, And what's happening is a lot of those 70s houses... Yeah. The land that they sit on is worth more than the house and land. People are knocking them down and building two new homes, each one worth more than a mill. And so what we're seeing in West Lake Shore is not gentrification, it's urban renewal, replacing new for old. And just in case anyone's going, well, what do you mean? That's, it's, it's all the same thing. Would you mind giving a little like, quick right. wrap up on... So gentrification is you keep the old mm. and make it new. So you buy yourself a... Like in, a in bungalow, a Tudor. A, yeah. And in, in Victoria, they call them Edwardian and Victorian or yep. Sydney, it's Californian bungalow. You buy one of those and you fix it up to make it new. Gotcha. Right? That's gentrification. Mm-hmm. Urban renewal is you get rid of the old, you knock it down, and you build new. So you replace it with townhouses. Is, is one historically, like in the data, more effective than the other? Yeah, gentrification. Okay. Because generally, older ho- there is a high proportion of older homes located closer to the city. So if we look at you know, any of our capital cities, mm-hmm. people built close to the CBD. Like back in the 1700s or 1800s, that's where they built their homes. Yep. All right. And then as time wore on, they went next door, next door, next door. So you know, most of our character homes are close to the city or beachside suburbs. So Glenelg has, has a high proportion of character homes. Even Port Norlunga, because that was a port. Mm. That has some character homes compared to, say, Seaford, which has virtually no character homes. Mm. Henley Beach has character homes. Grange has character homes. So some of these beachside suburbs in the old days were ports. So people built houses because that's where their work was, at the port. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so we're looking at, at Westlake Shore. And so the median house price then, what is that? Is like about 700? Nine, oh, uh, 900, no, it's about sorry. 900. 900. Okay, so but still well under everywhere as else. It, as was illustrated, yep. you can still find places for seven or 800. The house is not much. When I say the house is not much, it's not, I mean, you can knock it down and still make money, but it's still very livable. All right, you know, with a paint job and new floor coverings, yep. very livable. Um, so I would be, w- with any of these, uh, suburbs, I would be buying detached houses on reasonable sized blocks of land and just mm-hmm. holding on to them. Okay. Your rent's not going to be fantastic as if you bought further out from town, but again, I'm focused on capital growth and generally speaking, you have to sacrifice one for the other. You're either going for capital growth or you're either going for yield. Very hard to get both. And if someone's not wanting to buy an SA, don't know why they wouldn't, but if, if they wouldn't, or if, if they're not, is there anything else on the list for the, the next two that we've got that's outside of SA? Yeah, look, in Sydney, I'd be going to St. Peter's. St. Peter's? St. Peter's is next door to Marrickville. Okay. Now, unfortunately, median house price here is more than a million dollars, all right? But that's what you're going to have to pay in Sydney. And I reckon if you Googled my name and put in St. Peter's, you'll see an article or two that I've written about it. Yep. Uh, and it'll probably point out some of the best streets to buy in and some of the streets to avoid. Uh, St. Peter's is a bit like West Footscray and Thebiton, light industrial, yep. but the area is changing. Because Marrickville's already gone through a lot of gentrification. Yeah, itself, Marrickville was in my book. Actually, yeah. Marrickville was one of the best performing suburbs in Sydney out of the 20 that I picked. Yeah, right. Yeah. What do you think of Alexandria? Too many units for me. Okay. Which right. detracts from the character of the area, but Erskineville, Marrickville, Newtown, not as many. Sorry, I shouldn't say units. Apartments. Apartment. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So too many apartments detracts from the character of the area. Okay. But uh, there are some suburbs where, you, because of its location, you know, mm-hmm. like North Sydney has stacks of apartments, but the location is so good. It's North it Sydney. Yeah. That's right. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, and and why? Why St. Peter's second? Why did Marrickville take off first and now you're looking at St. Peter's going, okay, it's your time? Yeah, because it's ne- it's next door. It's one suburb further away. So the suburbs closer to... The, so Erskineville, I don't have Google Maps in front of me, but from memory, Erskineville is closest to the city out of those suburbs yep. and Newtown. And then you have Marrickville. And then after Marrickville is St. Peter's. There's also Enmore. Enmore was in the book. Yep. Uh, so Enmore, it, Enmore's a really interesting suburb, very eclectic. Eclectic, Ecl- okay. You like that yeah, word? I do, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, all the suburbs that I wrote about, I actually visited. And I visited more than 107 suburbs that were written in the book because mm-hmm. I visited... Some of the suburbs look great on paper, and then yep. when I turned up, a bit like Devon Park, you know, Devon Park <laughs> looks fantastic, but when you go there, no, nah, there is something missing here. Sorry to anyone living in <laughs> Devon Park. <laughs> All right, so when we're talking over a mil, what's the meat and house price there at one one point three? Yeah, one, yeah. So uh, sorry, people in Sydney. If you're looking to invest in Sydney, you're going to need more than a mil. Or if you're looking for capital growth, there are certainly places where you could buy that are cheaper than that, and you'll get a decent, you know, a pretty good yield. But you may not get that capital growth that you're seeking. Okay, and fifth and final one on the list. All right, so we better pick one for Melbourne, eh? Because I gave Melbourne a caning before. Yeah, I, I'm not keen on a lot of their policies, but, yeah. but let's let's go for it. Look, uh, Melbourne, I really like uh, Braybrook. Braybrook, okay. Braybrook. So uh, people probably heard of Yarraville, Seddon. Yes, yep. Footscray, West Footscray. Mm-hmm. This is next door. Uh, Braybrook is in the book, right? But what's happened in Braybrook, there was a high proportion of government housing that's being replaced or being sold off to private people because... Yarraville, Seddon, Footscray, West Footscray are so expensive. People still want to live close to the city. They can't afford that pre-war home in Seddon. Mm-hmm. They'll buy a post-war home in, in Braybrook. Braybrook. But on the Victorian note for a second, I always remember ever since I was a kid, not just like a recent thing, Melbourne and Sydney were hugely priced up. Brisbane and Adelaide, maybe even more so just Adelaide, it was like oh, half. And it was it was significantly different. The the median house price between Melbourne and Adelaide is still different, but I don't feel that the gap is there the same way anymore. 
are you looking at this as well? It's like the the story. I'm sure I've told you this before. The two shoe salesmen that they go to the village. One of them walks around, sees no one's wearing shoes, and he's like, "Time to go home." Wrong crowd. The other one's like, "Oh my god, everyone's a customer." Like it's it's the way that you look at it. Is it is it everyone's a customer time or is it time to go home? No, look in. The discrepancy there between Melbourne and Adelaide has decreased because of COVID. Like Adelaide property prices in the last three years have probably gone up 40%. Melbourne is probably where it was. Yeah, where pretty it much. Was. Like it went up, but then it went back down again. And so that that's a big difference. Um, and also, the so far as investors are concerned, the new laws coming in are not are not helping the property market, mm-hmm. the after effects of COVID with businesses going bust. Um, I felt like they felt it more yeah, as well. They did. Well, they were locked. They had a much more severe lockdown than the rest of yeah. the country. Uh, whether it was called for or not, I don't know. You know I'm not a health expert. Yeah. But they are just suffering the effects of that. Other places like Sydney, as I mentioned before, you know, mm-hmm. is doing quite well. Uh, Brisbane, Brisbane will continue to do well. To the Olympics. And it probably won't do well after the Olympics based on my research. So I did research on what happened to property prices in Sydney, in London, in... Beijing? I can't, no, I don't think it was Beijing. It was Rio. Rio. Right? Yep. And generally speaking, property prices shoot up straight after the announcement is made that the Olympics are going to be held there. Yep. And then growth is still pretty good as infrastructure improves. Mm-hmm. Once the Olympics are gone, property prices fall away. So for those people listening, if you're looking to invest in Brisbane, then I would be focusing on the Gabba, Wool and Gabba, because okay. that's going to be the hub and there'll be an uh, an improvement and an increase in amenities in that area. And Wool and Gabba is actually in my book. I mean, obviously 15 years ago, I didn't know that the Olympics were going to hold in Brisbane. That would have been quite an impressive <laughs> pick. <laughs> but Wool and Gabba is you know, just across the river from the city. Yeah. So f- just from its location point of view and its high proportion of character and period style homes is why it was in the book. Now that the the focus of the Olympics will be at the Woolloongabba, mm-hmm. it's even better. Okay. All right. I feel like I've, I've derailed us a little bit from Braybrook, but uh, so as far as Victoria is concerned, Braybrook's your pick. Uh, high concentration of post-war homes, did you say? In, in Adelaide, we're only interested really in renovating pre-war homes, mm. all right? Generally, they're yeah. spending big money. In Sydney and Melbourne, they're happy to spend big money on 1950s and 1960s homes. Whereas I, because I, probably because I grew up in a 1960s home, that's the last thing that I would do mm-hmm. is spend a lot of money on, which I did actually, because we did not one but two extensions to our 1960s home because we have four kids, so we had to put on lots of bedrooms. Is that an extension, your... Not the one that I live in now. Oh, we okay. live somewhere else in Torrensville. Right, okay. Yeah. But, you know, in the end, it's still a 1960s home. Yeah. Core Logic has it as a 1960s home. The Land Titles Office has it as a 1960s home. But even when you walk through the house, mm-hmm. all right, part of it is modern, but you've still got the skirting boards from the 1960s. The floorboards are radiator pine, which was what they had in the 1960s. Yep. You know, the ceiling height is what they had in the 1960s. Like, rather than fix that all up, just knock it down and start again. But... Because pre-war homes are so hard to find and so expensive in places like Sydney and Melbourne, mm-hmm. they're focusing on post-war homes. Next because best post- thing. Yeah. Well, they still they still have timber floors, yep. right, which people love. They, they still have fireplaces, which people love. Yeah. Okay. All right, and Braybrook's got a concentration of those close to the city. We're not close to the water the same way. No. Um, at median house price. Obviously, we're looking at less than Sydney, but a little more than Adelaide. Do you know yeah, where we're sitting roughly? So it'll be close to a million dollars. I don't know for sure. All right, Peter. So top five on the list, we've got Thebedon, Port and Lunga South, Westlake Shores, St. Peter's, and Braybrook. So three for SA, one for New South Wales, and one for Victoria. And we slipped in one for Brisbane. And we d- Oh, yes, that's Will right. The Gabba. Will and Gabba. Uh, okay. If, if you want to listen to to the rest of the list as well, make sure to click the link in the show notes below so you can actually listen to Peter's full talk. goes into even more detail than we've gone into here. And it's an actual lecture at Adelaide Uni as well. But, mate, i, I got to ask, is there anything that you could put down as an action step for people? If they've really liked what uh, they've heard today, I want to pull out the earphones and, I guess, start sharpening that that kind of research belt for themselves. Yes. So here's, 
plug not so much for me, but from the, for the uni. So I've I've developed a a subject at uni. Yep. Which is a non award subject. So you, what does that mean? You don't need to have passed matric to get to do it. You don't need an undergraduate degree to do it. Yeah, right. So and it's called Introduction to Property and Valuation. It's run at Adelaide University. Yeah. Uh, the code is PROP seven thousand and five. PROP seven thousand and five. You can enrol as a non award student. You you don't have to do any of the assessments. You just listen in to the lecture. Yeah. And come along to the workshop. And one of the most important activities is a field trip. So we go. We hop on a bus and we go to the best suburbs to invest in. And I demonstrate to people this is a good suburb because. Yep. This is a great street to invest in because these are the sorts of houses you should be investing in. These are the sorts of houses you should not be investing in. Love that. Okay. And and is that weird for a uni to do it something? Is, that, yeah. It is. I mean, I had to jump a number of hoops to do it. I was going to say. Yeah. But one of the reasons I've stayed on to teach is because I can teach that subject. If I wasn't able to teach that subject, I probably would have completely retired. Because you know, in all of my courses, I don't have any textbooks. Because yep. unfortunately, most of the textbooks about property are written in the US, right? But my focus is on using case studies, mm-hmm. what's really happening, and uh, research done by Australian researchers. So yes, we do a lot of research, but it's not it's not read chapters one, two, and three and answer questions four, five, and six. It's more practical. My, yeah, my tutorials don't go like that. Yeah. yeah, love it. Peter, I've asked you this question once before, but it was many moons ago, mm-hmm. and I need to still round out the episode the exact same way. Peter Kalisos now in 2023, what is your favourite pizza? Supreme with double anchovies. Supreme with double anchovies. And are you getting this anywhere special? Uh, yeah. Uh, Broadway pizza down at Glenelg. Broadway pizza. Have you tried Blue Velvet on Henley Beach Road? No, they're good, are they? Very good. Yeah? Yeah. If you're ever looking for somewhere a little bit nicer with the missus for like a pizza date, I know nicer and pizza date normally probably don't go together, but it's, it's I- lovely. You're a local, and I mean the other people that live in Adelaide might want to check this out. I went to Yellow Matter on Sunday. Yellow Matter, where craft is that? brewery on Marion Road. Good at Brooklyn Park. Yeah, yeah, they got a number of craft uh, beers on tap, and great pizza, and gin, and non-alcoholic stuff. One thing I didn't like about it, Todd, yeah. all of their pizzas are vegetarian. Okay. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is... So I said to my son, geez, I'm still hungry. That's because there was no meat on the pizza, Dad. Okay, let's go home for dinner then. Uh, <laughs> I, I was vegetarian for 15 years up until literally like four weeks ago. All right. I've, I've changed it now. So now that that would have been like, <laughs> yes, let's go there. Now it's like, oh, I look for somewhere else. Which, which to me, and I, you know, I've talked about gentrification. Yeah. This is a sign, you know, where yoga studios pop up and yep. gin bars and craft Something breweries. Trendy. Like who would have thought that a craft brewery would go in Brooklyn Park? Yeah. Would, you know... The planes fly directly overhead. You're on a busy road. Yeah. But mate, it was packed out. It works. Yeah, it does. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different, Peter, that we're mm-hmm. asking everyone now when they come into the studio. I've got a, a picture over here, which is just completely blank, apart from one person has signed it so far. I'm asking everyone to basically sign it, but write down something that you believe, either a word or a saying, that is the, the key or the, the real focus for what you've achieved in property. You can sign it wherever you like. It can be anything you want, Peter. Uh, just a word or a whole sentence. I'm taking the Nike logo. D- just, just do, do it. it. Love it. Because <laughs> un- I've been teaching for 25 years and unfortunately what I found is lots of people will pay money to come and do courses yeah. and do seminars, but most of them won't take action and buy. What do you think it is? I, I think... It, the borrowing of the money really scares them, yep. and, I, and I understand that. And I think some people are looking for the perfect property. Look, in the end, all property will increase in value. Yep. Right? But well-selected property will increase far greater in value than other property. Mm. So if you stick to the basics, buy close to the city or the sea and buy a house, you're not going to go backwards. You're going to set yourself up really well for retirement and possibly even an early retirement depending on how early you buy it and how many you buy. Because remember, you can't access your super until you're 60. Mm. But if you invest in property correctly, you can retire before you're 60. Peter, I think those are the perfect wise words of wisdom to end this episode out. But Big 200, thank you so much for jumping on the show. Peter Kalusos, it's always a pleasure to have you on.
Thank you. It's an honour to be here on your 200th. I wish you another wonderful 200, at least. Because this has been such a longer episode, I don't want to like give a massive wrap-up on this one. Otherwise, we're, we're just going to be sitting here for, for three hours. So I just want to quickly touch on, I suppose, one key point with all of this. And, and I kind of feel like this is what I get whenever I talk to, to Peter. It's the reassurance that like the doom and gloom, whilst there, there's certain aspects of it that are real, when you really actually start understanding things, when you really start actually breaking it down, it's the people that continuously take action in the right ways that are successful. Peter Peter never talks about it, and we purposely don't bring it up because we respect it when an investor comes on and doesn't want to talk about their portfolio. Uh, but I, I can tell you that the guy's built something incredible. Okay? I'll never go into to numbers at it out of respect for him. But but if we did share it, you'd be like, wow, that that's amazing. And I look at the, the way that he talks about investing, the way that he talks about developing. There's no real nonsense to it. There's no hype to it. He just finds the path of least resistance, makes the commitment, and consistently follows it, which is personally one of the things that I like about Peter. He's, he's got this kind of like, I, and I mean this with all due respect, but almost this like kind of grandfather wisdom. And I don't mean that in like a, he's old. Like obviously he's a, he's a bit older than me. But like when I, when I started flying about a year ago, one of the things that I actually really loved about the flight school is that it's run by a whole bunch of guys that are in their like 60s, 70s, and they're pretty, one guy, Carl's even 83, which I was like, is it safe to fly with this guy? But anyway, that's another story. But there's something about being around people that have been around the block. They, they've seen cycles. They, they approach this with a different calm, level head. And I think that if we can take a bit of that from the way that Peter looks at the world, through, through the lens of, of property investing, of course, it's only going to make us better property investors. Being able to coll collate your, your research to confidently and calmly give you that, that action to, to move forward and to, and to really just to start doing, I think is, is probably what, I know I was missing it for a long time, so it's, it's potentially what, what a lot of us are missing. But if there is something that you guys are missing as well, and you're thinking, unstuck, that's right, I forgot about that. That was the start of the episode, which was like six years ago now. <laughs> then make sure, click the link in the show notes below. Enter today. Share this with a friend. If you're like, oh, Kevin's stuck. Oh, what about Jaden? What about Terry? What Whoever. Send them this episode because we're going to be mentioning it on every episode now moving forward. Like I, I want to make this like the next thing that, that Pizza and Property focuses on to really start helping people move forward with their property investing goals. So click the link, tell us where you are, tell us where you want to be and tell us why you're stuck. Or if you want to fast track all of that and just go, can someone else just do it for me? A hundred percent they can. Support the people that support us here at Pizza and Property and actually make my crazy ideas like Unstuck Yourself actually a reality. Someone needs to pay for this. So if you want a buyer's agent to actually kick the goals for you, now it's more important than ever to pick the right location. As the wise Warren Buffett says, and has probably said a million times, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. The smart investors know now could be the time to get into the market. You just need to pick your asset with a little more precision these days. So if you want a buyer's agent in your corner who's still picking strong markets and quality assets, Get in touch with InvestorKit today. Go to InvestorKit.com.au and talk to Arjun Paliwal and his team about your property investing goals and let them explain their unique data-driven approach to help you get there. Take action, take control. You'll be glad you did. Talk to InvestorKit today. Go to InvestorKit.com.au or click the link in the show notes below. But otherwise, guys, that is enough from me today. I can't wait to see you sitting across the desk from me here. And I'm so happy that we've made it to 200 episodes. Here's to another 200 that are going to be even better. My name is Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast. And as always, have yourself an amazing rest of the week and stay awesome.